What up? How's it going, Mark? Oh, and you're recording me. You're recording me. Yes, yes, we are. We got a Hetfield portrait behind you. <laughs> yeah, man. 2012 Rolling Stone. That's, that's uh, is that that's probably a Ross Halfin photo or Halfin. This one, it's actually not. This is a portrait that was featured in Rolling Stone in 2012. And uh, when I lived in California, a little quick story about this. Uh, I had this outside my door every time I would leave in San Diego and Los Angeles, just as a reminder to enjoy the day and, and when in doubt, smile, right? Yes, so, dude. Fucking Hatfield. What a, what a good look up to, man. What's that? You have an inside joke. When it's not even an inside joke. It's, and I'm, I apologize if my internet fucks up. I have, I have, it gets all wonky, dude. Um, all good. But, uh. The whole band, where we all joke about who's going to get a Hetfield portrait tattoo first, and none of us have done it yet. But like, got to do it. No shit. Well, you're quite a fan. It looks like you got the Justice flag back there, man. Oh shit. Oh, and I'm wearing my Justice tie dye fucking Metallica shirt too. <laughs> right on, man. Love it. Love it. I, I, I found this. I found. I found this at a thrift store. And I, I sent a picture, I sent a picture of it to my friend. I'm like, dude, I gotta get this, it's eight bucks. He's like, where are you gonna wear that that you're not gonna get beat up? And now it's like my favorite shirt ever. Hell yeah, man, you're gonna wear it on I Ask No One. Are those sleeves off? You cut the sleeves off or? Oh yeah, I cut, I cut the sleeves off for sure. Nice. Gotta nice. do it. That exact flag behind you actually, they came through Buffalo, New York here in 2009. And during one, we were waving that flag. And during the darkness and prison to me part, James is right there in front of us. and. My little, my little hippie brother who loves fish and Grateful Dead was in his like thermal, you know, waving the the justice. And, you know, fucking, you know, it was That's great. Sick. That's so sick. right here, right now, we got Mark Helmune. Did I say that correctly? Dude, no one says it right, and I never, I never correct them because it's so weird. Everyone says Hailman, it's Heilman, but whatever, it's good. It's, it's a, it's a hard one to say. We got Mr. Heilman here from Rock and Roller Suicide Silence. I am honored. This is so cool. Top of every episode, brother, I like to have a cheers. And, um, you know, this weekend, it's Memorial Day weekend. So I cheers to the, the fallen dead who have honored our great country and to your fallen hero, uh, Mitch Adam Lucker. So cheers, brother. Yeah, cheers, dude. Nice. Yeah. Well, I like to start off a little fact of the day, top of the, I, you strike me as a music nerd, so I think you'll keep right up with me here. Um, but Carol King today is May the 25th. So Carol King in 1973, uh, she played to 100,000 people at Central Park in New York City. And Carol King, she's going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Uh, one of my dad's favorite records is Tapestry. You know, he'll play that all the time when we come over on Sundays. But also getting inducted is the Foo Fighters. Uh, we got Jay-Z being inducted and also the Almighty. Finally, Randy Rhodes, fucking Rhodes, you know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's awesome. on you, I'm sure. All my guitars that are hanging in the other room are hanging in front of a Randy Rhodes flag, the tribute flag, Ozzy on his on his shoulder. You know. Oh, nice, nice, killer. Uh, Klaus Mine, he. Well, one thing I want to ask you. So, with the Hall of Fame, who would you induct into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Who needs to get in there, man? I mean, top of the list, Maiden. Who needs to get in there that's not in there? And I'll be honest, man. I don't really even think about that stuff, like Grammys and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stuff. It's kind of like uh, the institutionalization of music and art, which I feel like is kind of adding prizes and things where it's like, uh, not that I totally disagree with it. You know, I don't mean to be like, fuck all that shit, but like, yeah. Uh, I, I always kind of look at that. It's like adding these accolades that are like almost not needed for music so much. It's like, it should be a little, it should be free form and like people that should be in it. Who should be in it? Is Pink Floyd in the, in the rock and roll hall of fame? They are. They, they are. Yeah. They have to be right. They have, they have to be. Hold on. Let me, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Honestly, I'd have to think about it. You know, okay. well, just let Motley Crue in there. You know, they're the ones that complain about it the most that want it. 
Yeah. You know, just, let, yeah. just let them in there. If you if you want it, then just give it to them. <laughs> Def Leppard got in there. You got to put crew in there. And maybe someday suicide can silence. Oh, oh man. That, I mean, <laughs> but, sure. Why not? <laughs> but the awards, I, I am. I'm kind of with you. You know, you go play a, a live set. You see the people out front. That's that's your that's your award right there, right? I was I was always kind of raised by any music teacher or my dad, any of the the real cool guys that I looked up to. Uh, it's like don't don't make music like the Olympics. Like don't make it where it's like you need to like somewhere or a group of people or anybody is going to be better or awarded for you know whether it's skill or whatever it is sure respect somebody that you know maybe shreds harder than somebody but it's like Kurt Cobain didn't shred like Ingve, but they both wrote badass music you know yeah so yeah. I, I kind of I've always kind of lived it like that like art is so subjective you know it's just it, the, the, the greatest art seems elementary you know yeah, and, and and not all of it is it, it, not all of it has to be studious and and like extremely. Uh, you don't have to even know music theory to write a good song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. And there's different definitions of heavy, and we'll we'll get into your kind of heavy that you've made an awesome career about. Uh, we got Mark Heilman. Did I say it correctly here? That's right, dude. Okay. That's right. All right, yeah. Mark Heilman, Suicide Silence. So also today, May the 25th, uh, lead singer of Scorpions, Klaus Mine, he turns 73. Um, Dang. Nice. Yeah, dude, I saw, Scorp I saw Scorpions in Belgium, and I had never seen them before, and that was so freaking awesome. Like, I've never seen a singer play the microphone so well. Really? I don't know if that makes sense, what but like... Play? What do you mean play? Like, like in... He, he was using the microphone to adjust, like for his voice, you know, like pulling it super far away when he was screaming, when he was singing really loud or pulling it really close when he was talking and hearing it come out of the PA and just hearing this voice, I guess Halford, you know, Halford does it too. But like, there's just, yeah, like there's just like a certain thing that like, that these really, really good vocalists, when you see them do that, you're like, oh, it's just, it's almost like they're playing an instrument, you know, like their instrument is their voice, but that microphone is so important in it. And I remember walking away, like I've never seen anyone play the microphone so well, you know? Well, it's good to know. I've never seen Scorpions before live. Uh, that is definitely bucket list type shit. But when I think of Scorpions, Mark, it's, you ever, you remember that scene from Tommy Boy where Chris Farley and David Spade are, are driving? I forget the song, but they're like crying while they're singing that song. What you song know? are they singing? What song are they singing? Down in there. I love you. And then the D comes or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, some of those some of those ballads from Scorpions will come out in the car. And I'm like, no one's looking. All right. You know, still loving you. You know, time and a sign. You know, and oh, it's just like totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite songs of all time. That is such a good song. Just yeah. totally. Have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard the the, the the conspiracy that the CIA hired music writers to help the Scorpions write Winds of Change to to take down the Soviet Union. <laughs> what the this fuck? is a real this oh. is a real thing. I just learned about it too. I just learned about it. Wes Houck was was on a doc from uh, from uh, God forbid and Bad Wolves podcast, the X Man podcast. They were talking about it, and once I heard them talking about, it, like I got to read about that. Like that's funny. Okay. Which shout out to Wes Houck and. Uh, alluvial their new record comes out on friday i don't know if you heard it heard this band alluvial but nope. awesome dude awesome awesome nope. stuff yeah nice, they're, they're on new for the last, but, nice. i'll yeah. post in the description yeah. so everyone could hear it myself included so rock and roll man that is uh that's awesome i like to start off with a little quote of the day too and today's quote before we get into it uh, I get the feeling you're an Arnold fan because a few years back in an interview, you had mentioned that whenever you're driving past that L.A. river, uh, I used to live in Culver City. I mean, there's no fucking river, but it's it's where Terminator 2 happened, right? Totally, so yeah. uh, the quote is from the greatest movie of all time is 1990s Total Recall. And uh, just just give me a minute. I, lo I love doing it. My twin brother in Greece, he loves he loves hearing it, too. So this is the plan. Get you asked to Mars and go to the Hilton and flash the brew bake ID at the desk. That's all there is to it. Just do what I tell you. If you can never, son of a bitch, you fuck you and me. 
Yeah, man. It's, I love that shit. So there you go. Do you have any go-to uh, Arnold quotes or movies? Well, dude, like our, our, our album, No Time to Bleed, is, is you know, yeah. Predator. Like, I ain't got time to bleed. Like, that, <laughs> that's basically where it kind of came from. <laughs> and and we, we would always joke about, son of Dylan, you son of a bitch. And just like, biceps. Just oh, like you. <laughs> bro, bro, check this out. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, all the way. Totally. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's classic. It's classic. Nice. Yeah, Predator can't beat it, 1987. So Mark Heilman, Suicide Silence, right here on I Ask No One. Um, again, this is an honor for me. I'll probably say it a few more times, but brother, um, what, when, when was that moment that you knew you were going to commit to the guitar and make this a professional career-long thing? Hmm. Um, it's kind of two things, two, two different times. One, and this is not what anyone would expect, but uh, in elementary school, my sister was already in high school and she would leave for school before me. So I would wake up in the morning, steal any CDs that I could, go down to the garage and listen to them on the big CD player that my dad had. So I, I would steal Guns N' Roses, Green Day, Offspring, Nirvana, you know, silver chair, whatever was going on in like, you know, the early 90s, Alice in Chains. And I was listening to Green Day Dookie. No, no joke. Oh. Listening to Green Day Dookie. And I just heard that. And I was young enough to not even know what was really going on and just go, whatever's happening right here, I want to do that. Like whatever's going on on this CD, like I want to, I want to rock like this. Like this is what I want to do. And like that's where the fire kind of started, you know? And then later on, like later on, once I really got into metal and started playing guitar uh more in like middle school it would there was no other choice there was nothing else i wanted to do other than just play play guitar and i've always still my life goal is be able to pay my bills with music that's it <laughs> yeah that's, that's simple simple that's awesome it's it's such a cool thing to strive for and we will get into your patreon page which i was just looking over and uh wow so green day dookie is where you where you kind of that fire started Welcome to Paradise, I think, is one of the all-time greatest feel-good songs ever written. <laughs> and totally. uh, that's off that record. So alternative music. And then uh, what was your first concert or your first rock concert that, that you saw live? My first real concert was OzFest 2001. Oh, and I went and I went to see Black Sabbath. That was like what I, I it's so funny you asked that. I was literally just texting with our merch guy and we were just chatting and talking about OzFest. And, uh, and I remember going to OzFest 2001 and like being a young kid, I was 14 and like hating every band. Cause I was that 14 year old elitist kid. I just want Sabbath, like, fuck you, Manson. Like, I don't give a shit about you, dude. And like, I, but uh, that, yeah, that was my, that was my first show. My dad took me and dude, Sabbath still, you know, probably, the, the band I don't say is my favorite band enough, but they're probably my favorite band of all time, like Sabbath, you know? And yeah, that changed, that, that set me, that set me up. I was already playing guitar and, uh, and in the grand scheme of things, Sabbath was the headliner beyond anything. Slipknot was just, had just put out Iowa. Uh, Lincoln Park was just starting. Disturbed was just getting out there. All these really great bands, you know, like amazing bands, but still like 2001 sabbath set me up i was just uh, that forever like i'll never forget how awesome that was the almighty black sabbath fuck i was honored to see them at the hollywood bowl in 2014 and then uh, again in san bernardino for the not fest ozfest for the final californian set right up front there in front of geezer where was that ozfest 20 2001 mark right there right there at glen helen where you were oh, just shit. saying oh okay Yep, yep. that's where I, that's where I saw every every Ozfest. Ozfest was basically my first real concert that I would that I mean I grew up on that. Every summer I would go to Ozfest. That was what I would do. But my I I, I was going to local punk and like small shows, just like little things. I think I had been to a couple of local shows like really young, uh, just local stuff. So those were my first shows. Was like more intimate kind of stuff. But real concert was Sabbath. Yeah. Fuck yeah, man. I used to work at the Hotel Bel Air, Wolfgang Puck. I have previous episodes about the celebrities that I came in contact with. And uh, those guys in 1972, you look at the home that they rented back in 72 to write 
volume four, my favorite Sabbath record. Uh, it's pretty crazy how just stratospheric heights in those seventies, man, they were just all of a sudden Kings and, and touring the world and can't beat them. Can't beat them. Um, but as far as heaviness goes, I mean, what mega, what, mega what, band. Yeah. Yeah. All the way, dude. What's, uh, what brought you to the heavy fucking death core, uh, kind of <laughs> death, the death kind of part of the metal that you really liked? Dude, that's a, that's, that's a good question too. Uh, just cause it happened almost on accident where in my development, I just didn't know there was such thing as like mega heavy, you know, I didn't even know about it. And, uh, there was one day I was with uh, an older friend of mine and I had just discovered Pantera and I was just getting into Slayer and that, and that was like w the, the brink of, you know, the heaviness for me. Um, Cause I was more into classic kind of rock. Like I was into Sabbath and Metallica and Maiden and, uh, and Priest and, and, you know, Deep Purple and uh, you know all this stuff. I was more into classic rock as like a, a young, a younger guy. And then my buddy Daniel Leon showed me Cryptopsy, Cannibal Corpse, Skinless, Dying Fetus, Decapitated, uh, all this stuff in one day. In one day, we're just sitting in his truck, you know, smoking some weed, <laughs> like just j jamming out to this extremely mayhem. Uh, uh, we were like, death, uh, all this stuff, man. Like all this just black metal and death metal. And some of the, 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 the musicality in it was off the charts, you know, like hearing, you know, the, like Vog from Decapitated and hearing he was 16 recording some of this stuff, like ripping. And that's, I, I was a little bit older than me, but I'm like so inspired by that. And uh, it was pretty much that day that I was like, I'm into death metal and black metal. <laughs> like, this is what, this is where I'm at now. Right. And, uh, and this was, and this was, and then a few years later is kind of where like the new wave of new American heavy metal or metalcore kind of came in and like Shadows Fall and Kill Switch and Chimera and all these bands started to come and they had more like breakdown, you know, kind of stuff, which I really liked, which what Pantera was, you know, do I liked that in Pantera, the groove. Fuck so it. there was this kind of perfect time. Uh, and in my area too, Asley Dying was from San Diego. That's not far from me. Atreyu, Avenged Sevenfold. All these people from Orange County, 18 Visions, Throwdown, um, all this stuff. And then really, you know, Suicide Silence was a local band, around, like pretty much at that time too. Like they started in 2002 before I was in the band. Mm -hmm. So I found out about them and, and all this stuff and the scene and like what was going on with the scene. And I kind of just became a part of it just because it was local to me. I didn't really try or it wasn't like that. Uh, it just kind of it just kind of worked. I don't know. Uh, and, and it's, I've had this discussion with Paul from Cannibal Corpse too. Like, when did you get into heavy metal or death metal or whatever? And he's like, I was always into punk, you know, I was always into like dead Kennedys and modus operandi and like all this kind of stuff like this. And, and he's like, I don't even remember how death metal started or when Cannibal Corpse made it, you know, like it, I, it, we have a similar kind of story in that where it's like, it just happened. It just kind of just developed and just and here we are like yeah. and organically happened and suicide Ooh. silence as i understand brother was founded in riverside california where are you right now are you in riverside or are you in I'm, in I'm in riverside county but i'm in temecula temecula yeah. okay temecula temecula escondido wait so Stone Brewing, is that Escondido or is that Temecula? Stone Brewing. It's, it's, it's Escondido, basically. San Marcos, yeah. It's down the road. Okay. I think yeah. I did a Tough mutter, dude, back in 2013 that I think my knees are still recovering from. Uh, yeah, it was, I think it was just outside Temecula. Is there a military base there, or close, close by there? Pendleton, Pendleton is right over the hill. Pendleton, okay. Yeah. Damn, that was... Pendleton, yeah. That was my yeah. ass. Okay. This is, this is like wine country where I'm at. This is like little mini Napa Valley. Like the, everybody comes here for the wine. There's like a bunch of vineyards and stuff around here. And it's a good time, man. I was just at a wine. I was just at a winery on Sunday. It's, that's, that's what we're known for now. And there's the Pachanga Indian casino. So it's kind of a rage here. There's a casino, <laughs> there's a winery. And that's pretty much all we got. Everyone comes here to party and L LA, OC, San Diego, they come here because it's only like an hour away, hour and a half away. 
and the weekends are packed with tourists and it's it's fun Temecula for wine. Yeah, my young brother was in Napa for a handful of years, then Australia, and he's just up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, just started working at uh, Penner Ash. So my dad actually, dude, he hosts a wine television show here in town called Spiel the Wine, and he's going yeah. on 10 years of that. So shit, dude, I want to get out to Temecula and taste some wines. Maybe one of these days we'll go dude. sip some wines, right? <laughs> Hit me up, dude. Miramonte. That's my spot, dude. I love Miramonte. <laughs> we'll go. Okay. Oh, that's good, dude. I'm For taking sure. notes here. Right on, dude. So when I think of your band, um, Suicide Silence, you joined after they came up with the name. I have to ask, and you've probably been asked this so many times before, it is such a brutal fucking band name. Where, what was the motivation there? Was it just like, oh, what's going to be the most, you know, darkest or most death name? you have an answer for that? It's super funny because I, I, I'll, I'll tell this story too, is that for years and years and years, um, I used to make up a different story for every single time anybody would ask me what the band name meant. And I would just lie and just say whatever I felt like saying. So any interviews, if you see that I'm saying it means something, totally <laughs> messing with whoever's interviewing me and just making shit up. Um, no, it's exactly what you said. It's exactly what you said. Uh, Garza, I don't remember if it was math class or science class. I think okay. it was freshman year and he, and he drew. It wasn't even that he came up with the band name. He came up with the band logo and he drew the scratchy, the old Suicide Silence logo, the very first one that looks like it's like, it, he said he was, I, I hope I'm saying it right. I think he was trying to make it look like it was cut with a knife. Okay. So it was like scratched up and he drew that on like science or math work in class. And that's where the band name came from. And the, the ethos of suicide silence has always just been trying to be the heaviest band in the world. That's it. Just yeah. try to be the heaviest band there is. Man, you guys, you guys bring it like this. I was cranking the fuck out of the cleansing, just getting set up here and smiling. You know, that's what also comes to mind, Mark, when I hear your band play. And when I see your band playing on TV, when, you know, cocking back some beers with Ryan, um, my twin brother, when he's in town, it's just we smile. You guys are like, it's just the, the screaming and the, the windmilling, which I want to get to here soon. But, dude, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, too, is I went to school in St. Augustine, Florida, Flagler College, and um, graduated in 2010. My buddy used to buzz my head to the cleansing. And that's how I found out what the suicide <laughs> silence was. I'd be in his fucking house kitchen with the, the checkered floor and he'd be blasting. I mean, windows open at the intersection there and the school's right that way and just cranking suicide silence. And I think the cleansing came out a little bit before then. And it just, you know, I get my hair cut. And to this day, I, I think of getting, you know, Zach Taylor buzzing my head to some suicide silence. Um, <laughs> but Mitch Lucker, dude, the, the, Late great Mitch Lucker. What was your impression like when you first met him? Dude, so uh, the first time that I saw Suicide Silence was the first time that I saw Mitch. I had never met him before. I didn't know what the singer of Suicide Silence looked like because I'd heard their demos. Because uh, we're from the area and the, it's just, you know, we all knew we all knew the music that was going on. But I saw them open for God Forbid and remembering never in 2003, early 2003. And my first, I've said this before, I saw them play and I saw him and I was like, this dude's got, I had never seen that kind of energy before. I like, other than maybe, you know, seeing, you know, Ozzy on stage or some like massive, you know, power. And, uh, it was intimidating almost. It was almost just like, whoa, like this guy's skinny and tall, but like, I still fuck with him. You know, like he, he was, he, he, he had this command and, uh, and his voice was insane. Like what was coming out of him was just crazy. And uh, yeah, it was an immediate like respect, you know, like I was just like respect to this dude. Like he is, he is going places. And uh and I, and I told him that story, you know, later on when I met him. But the first time I actually met him is, is a funny story. Him and a bunch of his friends showed up to a house party I was at. And it was in my town. And they were from Riverside, which is like 30 minutes up the road. And they were at this house party I was at. And I heard a bunch of people 
uh, like conspiring to like fight Mitch and all of his friends. And I grab, I, I, I went and grabbed him. I was like, Hey, what's up? You know, like, we don't know each other. I was, I was like, Oh, you, you know, I'm in from agony within, which was my band. And I was like, you know, like, I was like sh shooting my band at him. And, uh, and I was like, here, like, let me go talk to you for a second. I pulled him in the garage and I was like, these guys in here, uh, I heard him talking about trying to jump you and your friends. And he goes, he, he just goes, Oh, yeah, I'd like to see him fucking try like that's all and then, and, like, and then he's like let him do it you know like him and his buddies were just ready to fucking throw down and there was ended up being a massive fight in this cul-de-sac and it turned into a gigantic you know thing and uh it was it's, it's a really funny memory to look back to because like they pretty much beat the shit out of all these dudes that were trying to fight him <laughs> oh god and you guys are just dusting yourselves off and it's like hey man you want to be in my band or something like that <laughs> oh no i mean the, the way that worked was i mean Suicide Silence at the t at back then when I joined the band we didn't want to be looked at as a MySpace band but when I look back at it we were a MySpace band we were one of the bands that utilized MySpace and and blew it up and they were doing it before I was even in the band and uh, my band had a MySpace page and all this stuff and um, I had actually quit my band because of just differences with people and I was without a band for about three months. And I was hanging out at a buddy's house and then same dude that showed me Cryptopsy decapitated all that, all these bands that I've talked about earlier, Daniel Leon, shout out to Daniel Leon. He, he was on MySpace and he was like, Hey, Mark, Suicide Silence is having guitar tryouts. And I was like, Oh shit. Like, all right, I'll try out for that band. You know, they're, they're sick. And, uh, and then I called Mike Bodkins, the original bass player, because I knew him from apprenticing at a tattoo shop I used to hang out at, even though I was 17, 16, and I couldn't get tattooed yet. Um, so I called Mike Bodkins. I was like, hey, dude, can I try out for the band? And then I had my dad give me a ride to Mike Bodkins' house to try out. That sounds. <laughs> Damn. And then, yeah, I met, I met everybody. I met everybody but Mitch that day. Mitch didn't come until the first rehearsal before the official tryout which was that's how it worked like i went i met everybody showed them some stuff that i wrote uh talked about music jammed a little bit they're like tell you what take this cd and it was a live cd of them playing at the showcase theater in corona which is closed which was the best venue in the world for us it, it shaped the whole every one of my previous bands too um, they gave me a cd that was a, a live recording of them playing they said this is the set we're playing the whiskey, learn all these songs. It's in two weeks and uh, that'll be your official tryout. And, uh, and I, and yeah, I've told this story too. I have to tell, I always have to tell this. Like when we yeah, played sure. that show at the whiskey, Mitch, 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 uh, well, I'm about to walk, we're about to walk on stage and the crowd already knows we're about to play and they start cheering. And I've never had that happen to me before. I'm like, the, the crowd is excited to watch the band I'm about to play in. Like, this is nuts. <laughs> Mitch puts his finger to my chest three times really hard. Like, he's like, don't fuck up, you know? And, that, and then it looks me in the eye and I'm like, oh shit, all right, I'm not gonna fuck up then. <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> and then, and then yeah, I, got, I got the gig after that show. That is an awesome story, man. The whiskey, uh death metal pioneers detriments out of san pedro california my buddy mike he's been on a previous episode and we're actually going to be watching the rerun of the emperor live stream tonight on yeah, zoom nice. it'll be a good time but we've been backstage there at whiskey and if those walls could talk and fuck man at that place uh, really good time but then shortly thereafter mark you went on your first u.s tour in 2005 i take it how the fuck was that um 2000 2005 was when we first started touring. We did uh, we did an East Coast tour and we did a West Coast tour. The first real U.S. to the first full U.S. tour was 2006, mm. uh, and it was U.S. and Canada. And it was uh, it was actually with Allshaw Parish was our our direct support, and then uh, like this city who uh, I think is still together or getting back together. Okay. Um, and uh, and a band called Nights Like These, which was which was amazing. But pretty, it was pretty much everyone's first real U.S. tour, so we were all green and we were all excited and we were all just trying like friendly competition every night. And like back then, it was the beginning of Deathcore. Like Deathcore hadn't even really been labeled yet. You know, there hadn't been that that name Deathcore yet. And uh, 
it was insane because MySpace had hyped this up for all of us. And we were playing shows ranging from 200 people on a Wednesday to 700 people on a Friday or a Saturday. And, and we had never experienced this kind of stuff before night after night after night. And, uh, and yeah, like we really, we really learned how to, you know, be a band on that tour and like what it meant to, 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 keep the continuity of energy and bring it every night and just and and also at the same time create a network around the country and meet promoters and all this kind of stuff and uh and dude yeah some of the craziest stuff that's ever happened on tour was was on that first was on that first tour because when you're young you're kind of willing you're willing yeah. to let the craziness happen you don't really have that your grips about you yet where you're like oh i'm gonna walk away from this you're like no i'm getting in this shit you know <laughs> and yeah. uh were you in yeah, a van? So. Yeah, you weren't in a bus. I'm sure you're in a van smelling each other's farts and bullshit, right? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Oh yeah, yeah. We, were, yeah, we had the same van for a long time that we actually bought from the owner of the Showcase Theater, and uh, and I think it, yeah, it lasted that tour and like a few tours in 2007, and it died. We put 350 thousand miles on it. Oh shit. Well, Lars Ulrich, our boy of Metallica, man, he would say that he cherishes that Kill 'Em All for One tour that they did with Raven across the states. They were on their first, like, holy shit, we're out of California. We're in fucking Rochester, New Jersey, or wherever. Um, you have a crazy tour memory that stands out to you from that first tour or a moment uh, that you care to share? Uh, um. Yeah, yeah, well, the, story, the, the, time, the time, yeah, no, I mean, this, this one, this one is, uh, is, it's, it's extreme, but, uh, so we show up in Miami at this place called the Roxy Theater, and anybody that went to this show, they all remember this, like, this was a, there was a lot of people there, but we show up at one or two, whatever the time for load-in was, and there was already bands playing, and then we realized, oh, this promoter, they're putting on, like, a festival, and they didn't tell us. And we didn't know that that we were going to show up and not have to, you know, not have sound check. And uh, so there, we're 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 wondering when is our package going to start? When does when do all these local bands end, and when does our package start? Because we had five bands that were going to play, and uh, it was just a fucking mess all day long. And we're all pissed off, and like just like I said earlier, like you don't walk away from the problems when you're young; you go head first into it. Sure. And we're just we're just causing we're causing shit all day long like we don't give a fuck if these local bands play like you know we're like the reason why they're here is us and like all this bullshit it's like being being idiots and uh <laughs> and uh long story short we end up finally getting on stage at like 12 30 mid like mid after midnight which is insane like to be playing that late wow. and uh we start playing and the crowd is so stoked. It's this big theater, sloped floor, like a movie, like an empty movie theater. And they're going insane. And then a fight breaks out as they always did back in these days. And it was actually two girls fighting and pulling each other's hair. And, uh, and then there's a security guard on the side of my side of the stage. And uh, I didn't even see this happen, but he pulls out uh, pepper spray and he pepper sprays the entire, all of us. He pepper sprays the band. Oh, he doesn't pepper spray the fight that's happening. He just starts spraying all of us and like we're circle banging and head banging like crazy. You don't even see anything. I remember taking a deep breath and inhaling it all. And like, uh, and we were on our last song, Destruction of a Statue, playing the last breakdown, still going crazy. We finished the set. And then as soon as we're done playing, a full on riot breaks out and like the only riot I've ever really seen. And uh, the PA is getting thrown into the mirrors along the side of the wall. People are beating each other up. Like somebody took a, 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 a something and threw it through a, va a van back window, which was the promoter's van to bring the PA in. Oh shit. And the whole entire venue gets looted. Everything gets stolen except for our gear people go up on stage start wrapping our cables up throwing things in and loading it inside of our trailer for us so like no one's stealing from us everyone's loading all of our stuff up but the whole entire place gets looted and uh and basically we all just 
we've we we kick rocks we're out of there we're gone at a denny's down the road with all the bands on tour and like everyone's calling us so like we need to know where the promoter lives and all this shit (laughs) just turns into this big thing and i've talked to people in miami they're like dude that promoter disappeared after that like no one has heard from him ever again i'm sure you that's probably still one of the craziest yeah that is Uh, yeah it's probably still one of the craziest tour stories i've ever experienced anything ever no shit i'm sure every time you go back to south beach you think of that and maybe out there in the crowd there's someone that was from that shit storm of a fucking concert oh every time every time i meet somebody that's like i was there dude (laughs) (laughs) yeah well, I'm going to take a little Metallica intermission here because I just, I can't contain myself with that fucking tie-dye justice shirt. You got a justice <laughs> flag back there. You know, I got a fellow Metallica nerd on I Ask No One, Mark Heilman, Suicide Silence. Um, I've seen Metallica 38 times around the world and it's like a business trip for me to get my ass down to Kentucky when they play louder than life and to be right there because my twin brother and I were the twins up front. So that'll be shows number 39 and 40, you know, from Germany to fucking Vancouver. I was in the through the never fucking uh, during the highlight of that movie. If you watch it again, Mark, uh, when he goes to like hit the hammer on that ground and you see someone headbanging, I am yeah. still like permanently damaged back there from having that IMAX camera like right there. I was fucking dead. I was going nuts. So I knew I knew I recognized you, dude. I remember. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, man. But fucking Metallica. When when was the first time you saw Metallica, dude? Yeah, dude. I mean, I actually didn't see Metallica until 2011. I think was the first big four. Oh yeah, dude. And yeah, and well, then India. um and it yep in India, which is again, it's also just right over the hill from where I'm at, and uh, it happened on accident because one of my buddies hit me up and he's like hey dude tony uh, isn't going i have an extra ticket you want to roll with me like the night before and i'm like fuck yeah dude like you know i'd, I'd seen megadeth and seen slayer and anthrax but i had never seen metallica it's kind of a bigger thing you know you like going to see metallica is a big deal and i just had never done it so i went and saw him at the big four it was amazing it was so fucking good and then i basically just for about two or three years after that i vowed any opportunity I could, I was going to go see Metallica. So I went and saw Metallica uh, at the Orion Festival in New Jersey, like probably only a few months later. Um, or, well, it was yeah. the next year, yeah. Oh, it was okay. So it was the next year. And then um, that was where I, I and uh, yeah, so I saw them. That was awesome. And then I saw them at the Palladium after they played the Grammys. That was more recently. <laughs> Oh, nice. Uh, I, I was at that 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 super small show after they did the, the performance with Gaga. Yeah. Um, and that was amazing because like it was uh, it was just it was just perfect because we were with all these dudes, uh, like a bunch of friends from bands and we we're just singing to singing Metallica in the audience and drinking beers. It's like there is nothing better than that. Like it is so good. Um, but also because uh, I was I'm an ESP artist as Metallica is and um my old A&R at ESP he uh at Orion Fest he grabbed me and he's like hey dude we're going up and we're gonna go uh check out all the Metallica's rigs and go on stage and check everything out and I was like fuck yeah let's go dude he drags me up there and I just I, I he, he gave me an ESP jacket so that I looked official Oh, and, uh, and and like we're on stage, I got to go and look at all their ISO cabs and look at all their guitars and check out all their gear and and uh, meet their techs and all this stuff. And it was so fucking cool, man. I'll never forget that. It's, it's probably one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. Nice. Have you met James and Lars at all? No, I met I've met Trujillo. OK, Trujillo. I met Trujillo at Orion Festival and he was super cool. Really nice. We watched Sepultura together uh, at that show um nice from the side of the stage I mean, we were we were all, we were all on the side of the stage um which was awesome but funny story about the through the never uh movie uh we were we were writing an album i think we were writing you can't stop me and uh as a band you we were we stop me. you know dude and uh we were we were working on music and we're all massive metallica fans and uh, that movie was coming out 
we didn't know the release date. We didn't know anything. We just knew it was coming out. So we got on our phones and we're like, let's see when it's, if there's like, if it's playing and we look and we're like, oh, there's a showtime today at five o'clock. And it's down here at the, the Tyler Mall in Riverside. <laughs> and we're like, oh, let's buy some tickets. We bought the tickets. Didn't think anything of it. Show up a little bit earlier. There's this massive line all around. And we're like, we get in line and we're like, all right, I guess this is just what's happening. This is cool, you know, like I'm down. And then we start talking to other people in the line and they're like, oh dude, like Lars is coming and they're gonna introduce this. And this is like an early pre-screening showing. And we're like, we had no idea. We just bought tickets that day and, uh, and we're there. And then we all get our seats and then like we sit and wait. And then Lars comes in through the side door and he has a megaphone and he's like, oh, man, there's a lot of traffic out here in the IE and like starts talking through a megaphone and all this stuff. And he introduces the, sh the, introduces the movie. It was just the most random thing that has ever happened. Like, Lars is like 20 feet from us introducing the movie. It's, it's so awesome that you could fanboy over Metallica, uh, you know, and you, I'm sure you have so many others, myself included, throughout the, this, this conversation, fucking fanboying over you. I, it's just really awesome. My previous guest from last week was Ted Aguilar of Death Angel. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, this Saturday they have their live stream that they're putting a lot of time into, and yep. um, you go get that. You'll have it for the next two weeks. So um, I have a wedding this Saturday to go to, for Matt and Nadia, but I'll be watching that next week. Fucking, fucking rocking out some Death Angel, right? But, uh, dude, Big Four Indio, that was one of the greatest days of my life, too. It was my first time in Southern California. Um, two days before, I actually found out that I want a meet and greet. So there I am backstage when Anthrax is coming out. And I got hair down to my shoulders. I'm coming from Buffalo, 40-degree weather. I'm pale as shit. My eyes are on the back of my head. I'm a little hungover from the night before. And... You know, I meet, I meet Rob, I'm talking a little bit about, you know, surfing and then Kirk, you know, I said, you know, came in from Buffalo, New York, and we talked about the Great Lakes a little bit. I know he likes the water. And then uh, with the Lars, I asked him, hey, you know, you got any memories of Buffalo, New York? And he's just like, um, <laughs> you know, just looking out here. And he was so <laughs> short, was so short. That's when he kind of still had hair on the top. But he mentioned that was the first time they were ever snowed in uh, was the Ride the Lightning Tour when they played... Um, the Salty Dog Saloon in January of 85, 84, 85. And they had to spend the night and um, they've never had to do that before. In fact, Mark, two weeks ago, I'm in real estate and I showed a home to a fellow who had a Metallica shirt on. And it was really cold here at the time. I had my pea coat on. <laughs> so I took it off and I had my flaming skull shirt on fucking. And I'm like, hey, can I get a picture with you? You know, <laughs> So I got a picture with my client and um, which I'm just reminding me, I, I got to give him a call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a little too long. I got I to gotta, I gotta follow up on that. Um, but dude, he, uh, he's like, yeah, I was there when they were kids. So he was at that show, one of a few hundred people on that Ride the Lightning date, which is insane. But came to Hatfield, man. And um, if you go on their website, they recorded my entire conversation with him. And I can't believe it, dude. It's just, I basically didn't have any questions wore my heart on my sleeve and I'll email you that link. You'll get a kick out of it. You know, right. we hugged and shit like that, <laughs> you know, got a hug, dude. Got a hug. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you like Seattle 89 or San Diego? Dude, I, too? I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. The, the, the justice, uh, mega box, whatever the ultimate edition. Yep. That's Watch. pretty much like my go-to Metallica. I listen to when I listen to Metallica nowadays, that's what I'm listening to. Yeah. And hearing hit, hearing Hetfield and just his banter. And like what he says on stage, it's like, Hetfield is the man, dude. He is the man. Like, I don't, I don't really, I don't really worship musicians so much. I try to keep it. It's like, you know, we're all, we're all coming from the same spot. But when it comes to Metallica, that's kind of hard. Like you know, those dudes, those are, those are legends, man. Yeah. I showed Ted Aguilar last week, this, I mean, this is the, I disappear uh, ring that he's got. And he wore it around his, around his fucking neck in the nineties. I have blue diamonds in it to match my eyes. And um, I actually fist bumped him in Boise, Idaho on their last run. And before, during, and after our fist bump, he was looking right at this, you know, oh, that looks, that looks familiar, you know? <laughs> so that was awesome. But Seattle 89, dude, Whoa. like Seattle 89, when I went to learn the thing that should not be on these fucking drums, I didn't, I wasn't playing in my head the recorder version. I was like, bah, bah, you know, those fills that Lars squeezed into in that, in that, the performance, man, is just insane. Just just really aggro and, and the banter, yeah. You know, totally. get on the plane, fuck, you know, just so awesome.
totally yeah yeah there's something about like when you hear a band when they're you know that that i think metallica has had so many primes you know saying that that was their prime is kind of you know pigeonholing their their body of awesomeness over their career but like listening to that i think everyone can agree fire dude that, that, that's an on fire performance and it's uh it's it's what like i give guitar lessons here and there and one of my students asked me about like what does it mean when like a musician says that a band is on fire or like that they're like that they that they're like a hot band you know what what from a musician's point of view compared to just a person who enjoys music and i'm just like it's an indescribable kind of thing and I, and I cited Metallica 89 I'm like listen to that you know like listen to that that's a band on fire like in yeah. their prime yeah oh man absolutely I would agree with you there Moscow 91 which you know that uh dude I got my first tattoo when I was 28 years and 56 days old which is exactly how had all of Hatfield was at that fucking night and it's I asked no one of course alone <laughs> from wherever I may roam you know so just just uh yeah. Fucking love that shit. And that Black Record turns 30 this year. Waiting for the box set uh, news on that. I'll be adding it to the pile right over there. But let's say Metallica, they got the tour that comes up. Hey, Mark, we want to want you to come up on stage, perform a song. What's the one song that you perform Metallica with? Or what's one the, the, the one song, it's, t it's tough because it's like I would want to say something like uh, – like Creeping Death or Fight Fire with Fire, or Ride the Lightning. And then I'm like, well, those are challenging songs to play. I'd rather get on stage with Metallica and just play like Sad But True. I can just beef and just, oh my God, I can't imagine how just, I know how it feels to play with Suicide Silence when it's on and like the crowd is fully there. But like, I've never seen Metallica play Sad But True and not have the entire crowd just be slamming along with them. Oh, I, can't, I cannot imagine. That would be that would be some bucket list shit. Hell yeah. I cracked my first symbol ever to in the outro. Like, Bam you! you know? Oh yeah. And I got that right back there. I want Lars to sign that someday. But Sad But True, favorite. It's Lars's favorite song to play live, by the way, on drums. Um, awesome. Because he's... He's got the sick drums, the, you know, the best. That's 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 a that's a Lars Ulrich drum solo. You know, that's that's what you want from Lars right there. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, he quoted it back in the day. If you want weight, I'm your fucking guy. Because <laughs> you know? he just brings the weight. Um, what's uh, going back to Suicide Silence, and and that was fucking awesome. Just fanboying over Metallica, the Almighty, in my opinion, the greatest American band of all time. Uh, yeah, there's Grateful Dead, Kiss, Aerosmith, but put any of those bands in front of 50, 60,000 people in any place around the world, man. You'll see the fucking Limp Bizkit gets people jumping, but Metallica, no one commands the, <laughs> like James Hatfield, you know, come on. So I think you and Howard Stern, you and Howard Stern, uh, I've heard Howard Stern say that exact same thing, that, that Metallica is the greatest American rock and roll band. Did he say that? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, lo dude, he loves i know i know <laughs> he loves he loves metallica every time metallica's on howard stern it's always really awesome that, that james hetfield interview interview on there is really good really really good yeah howard stern connects uh definitely a big influence for me this uh podcast started in quarantine just over a year ago and uh, what became me talking about my souvenirs and my travels and now getting uh, i'm honored to connect with people i admire and heroes of mine such as yourself uh, mark heilman Suicide yeah, Silence and um, My pleasure, dude. Yeah, thanks, dude. Joe Rogan's big too. He had Hatfield on. I mean, for thirty minutes, dude. They talked about curing honey with bees. I know? was gonna say that. I was gonna say they talked about bees a lot. Yeah, yeah. which is really weird because an hour ago, before this started, yeah. a, bee, a swarm of bees is trying to to rehive on a trailer that I have out here, and it's there's there's thousands of bees and i'm waiting hours to find out if i gotta call a beekeeper to get them out here <laughs> oh. i should call hetfield and see what's up dude. <laughs> screw that man yeah i i knocked a phobia of bees out of the way recently actually because i just have too many bees have gone down my shirts in the day man i don't know bees just like to go down my shirt so i just when i see bees i'm like you know oh, all right I'm a, I'm a man i gotta take this you know <laughs> um Going back to Suicide Silence, my brother, uh, 2009 Golden Gods Awards. If my twin brother and me, we get some of our metal buddies over and we're, we're having some beers, dude, the Golden Gods performance of Unanswered 
that you guys did. It makes us smile. It makes us laugh. You guys are in suits up there. How was that? How, how was that day? You know, uh, really nerve wracking, you know, because <clears throat> we were we were still very young at that point. Like we had done some cool stuff and been around some some real uh, you know, successful bands and stuff. But that was the first time we were around, you know, Vinnie Paul, Alice in Chains. Uh, I, I, I can't remember everybody that was there at that exact one, but we were around, you know, rock royalty, as they say. And we were, you know, standing out like a sore thumb. We're like, let's wear suits, you know? So we wore suits, we're sweating. It's fucking kind of uncomfortable. I'd never worn a suit in my life. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then performing the way we perform in those suits I'm pretty sure, you know, it, you know, Mitch said like, oh, worst idea ever, <laughs> you know, like head banging in it, like it's all tight on the shoulders and like cuffs are rolling up and you start, yeah, exactly. Just start, but, you know, upon looking back at it, it was just uncomfortable because we had never done something like that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, all my, my, my big takeaway from that one was meeting Alice in Chains for the first time. And they've always been really friendly with us since then. And they introduced us uh, or like, when we won the award, they, they gave it to us. And, um, they were super cool. I have a picture right here, actually. Let me grab this. Might as well. Uh, uh, this, this is this is this is backstage Golden Gods Awards oh, with Allison Chains when we were killer. puppies, dude. We look so young. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, so this was this was right after we got done playing. Yeah. Right after we got done playing, um, and then there was you know the VIP bar. Memory was that. And then uh, meeting Vinnie Paul and Vinnie Paul telling Alex, our drummer, that he loved the, the one handed, which rest in peace, Vinnie Paul, yep. but he loved the one handed drum rolls is what he called the blast beats, you know, playing. He called it a one handed drum roll. And we thought that was so cool. We're like, Vinnie Paul called the blast beat a one handed drum roll. Like, that's fucking <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that that's a crazy memory. That was the first time we met Jose Mang and it's the first time we met a lot of these kind of you know people that have been pretty integral in our in our in our path. Uh, Jose Mangan, future guest on I Asked No One, uh, met him a few times over the course of the past several years at different big shows and shit. Uh, he's another guy that makes me smile at whenever he's on you know talking on liquid metal and and octane and shit and. He actually just trademarked uh, himself as the metal ambassador. So that's that's copyrighted. And uh, next year, going to be yeah. copywriting I Asked No One. So no one's going to be able to take that shit um, nice. in our, you know, for entertainment purposes. Nice. So awesome, man. I'm going to include a, a link in the below of uh, the 2009 Golden Gods performance, man. That is uh, fucking a joy to watch. But I love the headbanging, man. I don't really headbang anymore. And you guys are... You guys are doing the Jason Newsted windmill, like in unison. It's just the best, man. Did you get that from Jason? And how's your neck feeling these days? <laughs> uh, I think probably there's other parts of it that it's from Newstead. I would think a little bit more back to like Chris Barnes and Corpse Grinder doing circle <laughs> bangs, yeah. where I think a lot of us got it from. And uh and like Cannibal Corpse, they were doing synchronized circle bangs. You know that I think that was a big influence. We definitely choreographed our head bangs when we were young. Like we would, we would know like this. This riff calls for this. This riff calls for this. Just do what the riff calls for, and you know, you know, line up. Uh, but no, my neck is fucked, man. I have, <laughs> I have my neck is fucked up, and. And, and this pandemic really doesn't help because it's like kind of headbanging is like working out. You got to stretch your neck. This is not metal to talk about. You got to <laughs> stretch your neck. You got to prepare for, for fucking headbanging, dude. And like, these are good. This is how I do it. You push and you push on, on the yeah. sides or, you, or like this and you, you kind of prep it to, to not get a bang over. But no, I, no, my neck is fucked, man. I drove to San Francisco like a couple, like a month or two ago to visit a buddy. And that's a seven and a half hour drive. And then on the way back, I realized that just driving my neck like popped out of place and I had to go to the chiropractor. So yeah, my neck is yeah. fucked, <laughs> but it's all worth it. Dude. Yeah, it is worth it. It is worth it. There's traffic circles all over here, downtown Buffalo. And to check our blind spot, us headbangers, you know, you gotta, you gotta really just go, <laughs> you gotta turn that way. Okay, we're good. <laughs> A hundred percent. My, 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 my bad spot is my left side and that's my blind spot. Like I really do. I got to turn my shoulders just like you're saying. 
Yeah. Love, we share the bad spots on our left. That's funny. Um, uh, uh, first time I saw Suicide Silence, man. 2011, Extreme Wheels. This uh, piece of shit skateboard kind of uh, rollerblade joint. I don't even know if it's still there, but it was the summertime, July of 2011. And me and my younger brother, Leonard, went. I rushed the front. And so Eddie Hermida is the new singer of Su the newer uh, singer of Suicide Silence after Mitch passed away. Uh, Eddie Hermida fronted uh, All Shall Perish, who was opening for Suicide Silence. One of the first things he said to the crowd when he came out, he's, <laughs> he's like, man, smells like dick cheese and duck butter in here. What the fuck happened? <laughs> you know, it just <laughs> smells like dick cheese and duck butter and probably sweat from rollerblades or something. I don't know. But I, all of a sudden they went into their set uh, and I've never seen a rab more rabid bunch of fucking 13, 14 year old, 15 year old is just like fucking giving it to me. You know, it was, it was just wild. They loved that music and I love your music. You come out, you're the first one to come out for Suicide Silence. You walk stage left to right to your spot and you did this, you did a little shaka thing. And I'm Northeast as fuck, dude. Like Williamsville, New York, Buffalo, New York. I went to school in Florida, yeah, but that was the first time I saw this done like from an ind indigenous person of California. <laughs> yeah. You had the blonde hair, the beard and everything. You had the, the vans and these baggy ass fucking car. You, you, looked, you looked like uh, someone I've never seen before, honestly. And then, and then the last guy to come out was Mitch. And they had, you guys were just uh, on the Black Crown record. I was blasting that shit in the car earlier watching the, or going to my showings. And uh, wake up, wake up. And you guys come up. He comes up on the fucking pedestal there on the, on the riser. And I saw it was just dented. It was just dented from all the stomping from the, from the California ass looking skinny tattooed kid up there. And, you know, it was just, wow. it, was just it, it brought it to me and uh, it stung me. And I haven't forgotten about that. And uh, I'm sure that was a really good time um, on that tour, right? All shall perish. But, but it's funny. It's funny. I remember now. I remember that and how that all happened. Uh, Mayhem Festival 2011. That was an off show of Mayhem. And All Shall Perish and us played a show together at that venue. And we played there before. It wasn't our first time playing there. And you're, you're reminding me of all this stuff that I just literally don't didn't remember until right now. And that venue is, you know, kind of far away from everything. Like the nearest anything you're going to get is like nine or 10 miles. And that's far when you're on tour, you know, like, uh, so you're kind of contained, you got to order food and they sell, they sell like bags of chips and they sell candy and stuff because it's a skate park. And literally the, the <laughs> smell of dick cheese and duck butter. I remember I'm like, this is fucking balls from people skating and, and, and all that. And it's Dorito breath. And like <laughs> shitty shit, you know, like I can actually smell it now. And yeah, that venue is not exactly an ideal venue. Sound is so bad, just bouncing around everywhere. But uh, those those crowds were always super rowdy in in that. That's that's upstate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, upstate, yeah. upstate New, yeah, upstate New York, definitely always rowdy crowds. A little bit intimidating. You never know. You know what what really is going to happen at those shows because like it, it used to get pretty violent at our shows you know and and i i particularly remember that one being like pretty nuts you know just like you're saying a lot of young kids just letting shit out and uh and yeah dude definitely fucking throwing the throwing the shaka dude like i grew up skateboarding you know like i'm totally you know a skateboard guitar player kind yeah of dude I'm totally california so that's 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 great that I that you caught that as an East Coaster. Like, look at this indigenous California man <laughs> sending the chuck. Like, like that. yeah, that's that's totally true, man. Uh, do you have any special sneakers or socks or underwear that you you wear on stage uh, as a ritual or a pre-show ritual? Something you have to wear or do on gig day? It's evolved. It's evolved over the years. Um, like going back to my very first show with Suicide Silence, that whiskey show. Um, back then, I was wearing a pair of camo shorts and a Cowboys from Hell T-shirt, and I don't think that the underwear mattered back then. But I had worn those 
that outfit on stage every single show I had played with my two previous bands without restraint and from agony within which were just local bands but uh um by the time I played the show with Suicide Silence holes in there was complete holes in the in the sleeves of the Cowboys from Hell shirt the the my camo shorts were just tattered just ripped like you could see my underwear through them and, uh, and, and it was also funny for me because I'm like, yeah, like I'm wearing these clothes because this is what I wear when I play. But I didn't really know the guys in Suicide Silence yet. And they look at my outfit and I'm just, I look like a fucking Hessian. Like I just look so ripped up, like crust punk rock, <laughs> weirdo. And uh, you didn't wash these clothes. These clothes are not washed, dried or. Um, that's a good question. Probably not. Yeah. You know, probably not, you know. Um, but that, that was when I retired those clothes and I still have these clothes in my, in my, my closet in a, in a bag. Um, but it, over the years, what I would do is I would pick out my outfit for a tour and I would wear that and I would probably wear the same underwear and the same socks and the same Chuck Taylors. A lot of times they were ride the lightning Chuck Taylors or kill them all Chuck Taylors. Um, and those were my power shoes as I would call them. And I would usually, and I wouldn't wash them, but it has changed over the years because I just don't like stinking like shit anymore. And I will wash my stage clothes once, maybe every two weeks or something like that, because my sweat, it's, this is the weirdest shit. My sweat smells like cum and ammonia. No <laughs> And I didn't even, I didn't even fucking label that. Everyone's like, dude, you, fuck, you smell like you just like jerked off and all over your fucking stage clothes. And it just rotted and like grew like some ammonia base. Like, so dude, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, just, I, I gotta wash them. I gotta wash them. Same with my guitar strap. Ugh, yeah. It's fucking terrible. <laughs> Man, I think you just came up with the next Suicide Silence album cover or album title, Come in Ammonia. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> uh, like load and reload, right? It was semen and piss and, you know, whatever the fuck it was. Common ammonia. Wonder what that would look like, you know, on a petri dish, you know? That'd be, be pretty curious. <laughs> what does ammonia look like? I just, I just think of ammonia as a scent and it's terrible. Right. It is terrible. Well, dude, uh, I, I have to ask you in, in closing about suicide silence, Mark. If your boy Mitch was to come, and by the way, I was at that site um, for my viewers. Mitch Lucker uh, passed away uh, in a motorcycle accident on Halloween night in 2012, uh, at a very young age. He was born in '84, uh, and he had just turned, um, let's see, 26, 27, 28. He just turned 28. Was that he just turned 28 like a week before? Yeah. Yeah. God bless him. What song do you guys? with a zombie Mitch Lucker up there at the helm. What song do you guys just fucking give it to the- Dude, it's, it's, it's crazy because um, when I think about that, I think about what he has become since his passing, you know? Like he's more, he's more immortalized and more legendary now. He was very much influential when he was alive and it was really cool to be a part of and be you know friends with someone to like watch that happen to someone that you know you know and see them become legitimately famous you know it's, it's crazy to watch and now what you only live once has become because of his passing if he was coming back to life and we're in a world where he's back and we're playing a show like you only live once is the thing that we're playing and it's got to be you know at like a big festival in front of a shit ton of people because we really only got to do that for a, a short amount of time where we were you know where i looked you know the peak with mitch was that 2011 to right before he passed and we did some very large festivals when you only live once was out and that was a i was a, i remember playing in uh chile uh with cannibal corpse in front of 3500 people and we were opening with you only live once and it, and just op coming out and opening with that song in front of this like you know 3500 person crowd that still is one of the coolest memories that I've ever had. And that was uh, probably about nine months before he passed. And that was still just so insane. Same with With Full Force, which is the, the picture where he's got his hand up like this and there's just a sea of people. Yeah. That was, another, that was With Full Force in Germany. And uh, same thing. Like, it's almost like really my real answer to that is I, I wouldn't even want to like bring him back to life and do it now. I'd rather go and re and do those those things again and like really feel it because like what a what a haze we were all in and like that trajectory and everything that was going on back then it's uh 
we were so young, man. It was just crazy. It was a crazy thing to live through. And that's something that I'm really grateful for. And I, I definitely reflect that. Uh, yeah, looking at videos and watching and, 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 and pictures and stuff. Damn, you only live once. Just let, let's do that one more time with Mitch. <laughs> and the line is in the course, you only live once or just go fucking nuts and re repeat it. You, know, you only live once or just go fucking nuts. You know, I, I do that with my brother. We'll watch that. And that's really, that's, uh, that's fucking powerful and awesome. And you only live once uh, performing with Randy Blythe, previous guest, you know, our pal, Randy Blythe. He, uh, that is a fucking killer performance when you guys honored Mitch and you brought the, the your guests and, and, you know, friends of his and performer. Totally. I mean, dude, when he's like, live, live, heart, and then, oh, and he's got the fucking crowd surfing. And two, two stories about that. So that was not our idea, stopping and having, and having him sing like that. Oh, really? um, so we had, we, had a, we had a rehearsal studio where we brought everybody in and we rehearsed for two days. And it was really fun. It was a really cool thing. And uh, uh, we had all the vocalists come in and we had it, you know, choreographed like, you show up at this time and we'll practice the song. You show up at this time, we'll practice the song. Everybody showed up way early and it was like everyone was performing in front of the, the other vocalists. So there was a, a rehearsal studio and then like a crowd of all the vocalists that were going to be singing. And it was pretty much everybody but Randy, uh, I can't remember everybody that didn't show up, but the, everybody that wasn't there for those rehearsal days, we were going to rehearse a uh, sound check the day of the show. And Randy <laughs> was one of those people. And Randy comes in and goes, hi guys, I already have to talk to Randy. You know, Randy just, and he's going, going. And, and, and he's like, all right, I got this idea. We're going to stop right here. And I'm going to jump in the crowd and I'm going to start screaming these words and all this stuff. And then I'm going to signal to you, Alex, and, <laughs> and, you're, and we're going to start going. So we rehearse it. We rehearse it once. We rehearse it once uh, because we're on a click track. So Alex had to figure out, all right, I got to stop the click track here, and then we'll jump in, no click, and finish the song. And uh, and obviously it went over so good, and it's immortalized and, and amazing. And there's great photos from there. And uh, if 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 anybody wants to see uh, some cool photos from those uh, those that that show, Fourth Horseman Pizza is a metal pizza bar in Long Beach that our old videographer owns. And there's pictures from the the, the Mitch Memorial show. And one of the best ones is is Randy screaming in a Bad Brains shirt at our show. And uh, we're not even in the picture, but it's Randy in front of a big crowd. And it's like, oh, that's the Mitch, that's the Mitch show, and it's badass. Um, so that's 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 the story about Randy and You Only Live Once. But the other thing about You Only Live Once is uh, when we were writing the Black Crown. I had those riffs. Those were riffs that I had from a long time ago. Those were riffs that I'd just been sitting on that I didn't think sounded very Suicide Silence-ish. You know, like I was just like, this doesn't really sound like what Suicide Silence sounds like. And remember, I joined the band and I've always treated Suicide Silence as a band I joined and I want to contribute to. It's not like something I own and, I, and I'm like, I want it to be this way. It's always been, I present my ideas and I want to, I want to make the band as badass as I can. So I was, I presented these riffs one day and I'm like, I don't really know if this works. Start going bound, took it down, took it down, start playing. And it was like, that's fucking sick. Like, let's, <laughs> like, let's work on something like that. And then, uh, you know, the, the intro is very much influenced by Cowboys from Hell. Took it, 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 you know, it doesn't, it just kind of goes over, it kind of goes over your head a little bit, but it's influenced by that a little bit. But when we finished the song, because it's kind of, uh, you know, it was, a lot of my ideas Mitch gives me the lyrics and, and I and I see the lyrics and I'm like you only live once I was like I don't really know if these lyrics fit this song you know I was like I, I mean I like the lyrics but like I don't know if they fit the song and Mitch is like well that's th th these are the lyrics for the song this is what we're gonna do and I was like all right well if you say so this is what it is and then it literally becomes like one of our biggest songs we've ever done and and I love telling that story because it also just shows I don't fucking know everything. I don't know what people are going to like. I just like to fucking write sick shit. And, and it's always the group that comes together and like suicide silence as a, as a whole that like, we're the ones it's, it's not, it's not one person. It's, 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 it's all of us. So, and that's, that's exactly, that's a, a you know, a good, a good story on how we work. It's always like, maybe, maybe not everyone agrees on it, but the person that came up with it, they, they're, they're wholeheartedly believing in it. So. Mm. 
Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Chester Bennington, Lincoln Park. Uh, he 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 thought in the end wasn't going to be anything. You know, in the end, just hit one. It was one of the first rock songs to hit one billion views on YouTube. Uh, talking about YouTube, you only live once. Just passed over a hundred million views, and it's just yep. under one hundred and one million views. And I think it's just such a tribute, such a beautiful fucking song. And that's a really cool story about you only live once. And I can't wait to share this with with others when this airs. Um, so that was amazing. You're also on uh, Patreon. Yeah. What, what is Patreon? I'd never heard of it until this week when I was looking you up and, and uh, man, I want to start contributing to that and, and get in on the fun. So what, what is that Patreon? Patreon is like a, it's like a subscription based fan club and it's really creative for the artist because it's like you, the artist creates what the tiers are. So you'll have a, a my, mine in particular, I have a dollar, $5, $10 and a $50. And then I have a hundred dollar and a $500. Um, and for a dollar, which is just good support, doesn't cost much. I have a private Instagram that I pretty much, you know, I'll answer DMs and talk to fans and stuff like that. And uh, post a little bit more candid stuff, stories that I, I wouldn't necessarily put out to the, to the, to everybody. Uh, Cause I know that fans care about this stuff. It's not, for everybody um so and then i and then i do a five dollar tier where i upload just demo riffs and songs that i do right here i'm sitting at my studio desk right now like anything that i that i that i come up with whether it's metal or not i upload just songs and riff ideas and then tell a little story about where i came up with it and uh and 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 usually post you know once a week something something from the riff journal as i call it and then uh ten dollar tier i do little mini lessons where i'll get on and just you know teach guitar technique and and then i put up tabs and i'll put up you know licks that i use or you know teach teach suicide silence songs and then really which i didn't predict being so popular and being something that people were really stoked about was i i started a it's a fifty dollar tier and i call it the patreon band and we named the patreon band the headlining band because it's just funny and, uh, and I get together with them pretty much once a week, Mondays. Um, sometimes not everybody can make it. And we just write riffs. We just come up with funny, like cool ideas. We'll, I usually will come up with a, a theme to, to a song. We're like calling a theme. Like we did one where any musician theory nerds out there will know what a minor second is. A minor second is stacking two notes that are half step apart. It's, it's, it's this. It's a... Uh, the most annoying thing you could possibly do. It has the most dissonance out of any any interval. We wrote a song that is all minor seconds, but we tried to make it sound listenable and not make it sound dissonant. So like that would be a theme that we would do. And usually it takes us about a month and we write a song and then I upload that to the Riff Journal. And uh, and and yeah, it's been, it's it's super fun. It started from the pandemic and a way for me to connect with fans and, and also just stay busy and stay creative. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. And then I do have a hundred dollar tier where it's like, if you're in a band and you want me to write a riff or contribute to a, a song that you're writing, send me your track and I'll write a riff. You know, maybe you got writer's block and you don't know where to go with it. I'll write a riff for you and you know, you can take it and it's yours. And then a $500 tier, I'll do a guest solo, which I just did my first guest solo for a, a band called the Nihilist from Canada. I don't think he's released it yet. It's a one man deathcore band, but I really liked the solo that I did for him. And, uh, ended up being really cool so and the tons of people have patreons um it's hmm. it's it's been going on for a while now and uh, i see it really uh empowering the independent musician because uh you can you can really have direct access to uh people that support what you do they're actual they're your supporters they're not just people that are you know kind of window shopping at what you're doing because it's hard to make money as an artist dude it's hard to make money as an artist so patreon i'm really grateful for it uh especially because it's not like I'm getting rich on it or anything, but it gives me the opportunity to, to stay creative, stay connected with the fans and have fun. It's a, it's a really big testament to, to how cool you are. You know, it shows a lot of character to do that, to write music. You know, granted, yeah, you're getting paid for it, but I mean, if people dig your shit enough, I mean, it's just nothing. Um, I look forward to check out your page. And dude, we're going on an hour and 18 minutes. And Again, it's just uh, it's, it's just how cool you are to actually come on and to give other people and your fans your time. 
Uh, I think that's one of the definitely consistent things I've seen throughout your career is how cool you are with fans. And uh, just on behalf of us Suicide Silence fans, thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to touch on that, too. There's a reason why, you know, it all goes back to Dimebag Daryl, dude. I grew up big Pantera fan and seeing the way Dimebag was uh, in the Pantera home videos and he would and in his interviews and talking about, you know, hearing people say, you know, I met Dimebag and we literally got drunk together. We took shots and we fucking hung out. And like once I heard that Dimebag was that cool, that became my ultimate model of if I ever can do this. Like, I'm going to treat everyone like it's their fucking birthday, and I want to leave a memory with them, whether or not I remember it or not, like, it's hard to remember every, all of it, but it's like, leave a memory with somebody where it's like, yeah, dude, you know, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, you can change someone's fucking life, you know, by just being cool. So, like, that's where it all comes from is fucking dime bag, dude. We first connected probably about three, four weeks ago, and it was like, all right, what day am I going to pick? I picked May 25th. I'm not going to get into the history of it. May 25th has always been kind of a, a fun date for me, and this is something I won't fucking forget, dude. I look forward to sip some wines maybe someday at, uh, I'll look up the website. Uh, the name of the winery, what is that? Miramonte, dude. Miramonte, yeah. all right. Miramonte it is. One last question. Yeah. Who's your favorite Mortal Kombat character? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite. Dude, I'm freaking boring. No, actually, my favorite my favorite Mortal Kombat character is Goro, and it always pissed <laughs> me off that you couldn't play as him in the first one. Yeah, that was so you know? lame, right? It's so lame, but I mean, that was pre when video games didn't really give you that god mode where you could just destroy everything. Yeah. You know, like they hadn't really done that yet. It was still arcade. Like you couldn't just beat the entire game super easy. They had to have it so you could pump the quarters in, which I'm old enough to actually have been playing Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat 2 on arcade. And, uh, yeah. and I, I, remember, I remember those days. And yeah, dude, Goro, man. And then in the movie when Johnny Cage punches him <laughs> in the nuts, dude, like, come on. Oh, man, that's, uh, that's great shit, man. I, I like, uh, I'm a Cabal and Shang Tsung guy. I love that movie, the 1995 movie. They had that new Mortal Kombat movie that came out. I heard it was shit. I haven't seen it yet. Don't listen to people, dude. It was just fine. Okay, cool. It was just fine. People, what do you expect? It's Mortal Kombat, dude. Just go watch it and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, Suicide Silence on tour this fall with Ginger and motherfucking All Hell the Yeti. Haven't heard of that band. I think that's a pretty cool band name, All Hell the Yeti. Where are they from? Do you know? I think they might be from LA. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah. We played with that. That's a, that's, that's funny that I don't know where they're from. They've been around for a while. We played with them in 2011 in San Luis Obispo. That was the first time we ever saw them. Oh shit. And, uh, and yeah, they're kind of, they're cool. They're like an alternative metal band. I don't know how else to put it. It's kind of, they're, they're heavy, but they're, they're, they still got like, you know, the octane kind of status rock feel, you know, it's good we, shit. I'll check them out. I'll post a little link to, to one of their songs that I like below. And uh, one last thing, man, House of Blues, San Diego, 2014. It was after the show, had a bunch of beers in the system, had a really fun time in the pit. I was wearing this shirt and you had your Pantera shirt on and my buddy took a picture of us and it was blurry as shit. And I was so pissed off when I saw it because it was just, you had the funniest face, I need your tongue out, whatever. Could we retake a picture right now? So I Absolutely, dude, fuck okay. yeah. So we're gonna go three, two, one. <laughs> cool <laughs> nice well hey to my viewers you like what you saw hit a like subscribe really appreciate the support uh with every uh new subscribe i make a little donation to the american Feder american foundation of suicide prevention just became a member of the board of directors this this week so Very nice congrats awesome, stuff to, awesome dude yep yeah awesome. mike michael j holden live forever so stay happy stay healthy Stay hungry, stay fucking heavy, man. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Peace, Mark. Later, brother. Have a good one. Thanks.